So a few items of business as far as what the plan is for this week. Um, today I want to go over to 2.1, lesson 2.1. So I'll start by going over the slides first. It hopefully will take an hour or two to get through. There's about 45, so we'll see where the 45 slides, so let's see how that goes. Um, but my plan is to go over the slides and then release you to do the code, code lab kind of at your own pace today. Tomorrow, same thing. So we'll go over 2.2 two, and, and then I'll let you do the code labs for that. We'll do 2.3 on Wednesday, 3.1, 3.2. So plan is to then finish up with unit one or lesson 3.3 on Monday next week. So I think that kind of syncs up with what looks like it is going to be our pace. You know, we'll adjust as, as goes, but that's the current plan, which means that our next hands-on test will be next Tuesday, if that's, if that's our pace. Um, any questions on that? Okay. I haven't updated everything necessarily on, I think, I haven't updated everything on Inside Rankin, those due dates according to, to that, but I will be, will be doing so. Um, assuming that that's, that's where we end up. So, um, one thing I do want to mention briefly on the perusal side, um, make sure when you're putting in those annotations, make sure that those annotations only cover the minimum amount of text that you need to. Um, because remember, those annotations are seen by everybody, right? So if you put an annotation on the entire paragraph, that makes it harder for everybody to read that paragraph, okay? so. When you're putting in an annotation, keep it down to a sentence at most, please. Um, preferably only like a, a short phrase, maybe two or three words is kind of the, the preferred way to do that. Yes, yeah. Annotations that you do in person. So please keep those brief. Um, I think I've asked the, the one or two people that did that to remove it and re-add it in a shorter sort of section. Um, but that's what that's about. Does that make sense? So please make sure that you're putting it on there brief. Um, one question was asked about, you know, hey, we've got these strings XML files, right? So we want to ideally, anytime we have a string in our text, in our in our app, we want to move that into strings XML, right? Do you remember what my some of my reasons for that was? Why do we need to move those? Why do we need to move those strings in the string XML in the instead of just hard coding them into our layout or our JavaScript. Uh, if you have the same button on multiple layouts, it'll change the label on all of them. Right, so I would say maybe under code reuse, yeah. right? Um, you could also talk about that as the maintainability aspect. So let's say I start making my app and I want to all have my, all of my OK buttons. I start them as the text OK. And down the road, I decide I want to change that to that, right? If I put that all in the strings XML file, I only have one place to change. So that's one thing that lets me do it. You got a hand up? OK. So that's one side. Um, Brandon, did you have a hand up? No. OK. So that's one side, but there's there's another piece to it, right? So this is one reason. It's actually not the most important one. So you can access it in the, um, what's it called? the activity. Okay. What do you mean? So like, I don't know what it's called, but I like. Where you put like the, the Java code. Okay. So where I can put the Java code. Okay, so well I can I can access it there, yeah. Isn't there a what? Isn't it personalization? Yes, it is. Right. So so that's the big reason, which I'm gonna put down here number three. Briefly let's talk about so so translation was really the big reason why we had this file to begin with. Okay. Um, but as you were kind of mentioning, or maybe hinting at there, 
as well is let's say I have a value, right? I want to put it both in my layout as maybe a default value as well as I want to have it in my code to reset to that value. Does that make sense? So for instance, I, I walked through a few with a few of you where we, we had that zero button and then reset back to the default color, right? It makes sense to put that default color into your caller's resource file so that you can refer to it initially in your layout as well as refer it to it in your code, right? So that that is one upside is is defaults perhaps. Otherwise, we'd have potentially one value over here in the XML, and we have another value over in our code, right? So that's one thing. So the translations, though, is the big deal. That's the big reason of why we want to do this in the first place. So under res values, strings XML. So that's where all the default strings go, all the default translations. So let's say we're making an app, well, all of those are going to be in English, right? If you had a Japanese company making an app, well, their default language is going to be Japanese, right? So that is the default language or the fallback, right? If it can't find a translation, it's going to go pull it from here, right? So what we do, let's say we want to take this and we want to translate in this in Spanish. We make another file, res values. Instead of just saying values, I might say values es for Spanish or Espanol. Because every language has its own kind of language type, right? And then this would be strings XML here as well. And I may actually have a bunch of these. So I have one that's es. For Spanish, I might have one that's FR for French. I might have one that's JA for Japanese. The upside of this is pretty much all I have to do when I want to translate it from one language to another. Typically, all I have to do is replace that one file. Right. In fact, if you go to deploy your app, um, it will actually pick up the strings XML file on the Android console in the console that you use to deploy your app. And it'll say, oh, do you want to uh, hire a company to translate that for you? Um, and you can actually you can actually hire a company through the, the publish in that Android console. They'll take this and give you back a translated version. You want to say you want to translate it to Japanese? You give them the strings XML file, they give you a Japanese version of that. And now you can now you can deploy your, your app in Japanese. Does that make sense? The biggest reason why it's there is for the purpose of translation, okay? and and that's that's vitally important because most apps that we build are going to go global. They're going to be made available global. That's the default way we deploy them. Okay, so so we want to be able to support all the languages that are out there. Okay, um, the other thing to note in there, most countries, even if you're just deploying to one country, there's a lot more than one language, right? So if you want to really get all of the U.S. population, right, you really do have to deploy an English version and a Spanish version, right? Otherwise, you're missing a big market sector. Well, if this is as simple as it is, there's almost no reason why you shouldn't do that. Does that make sense? They've made it very easy to do the translation. Um, now, that being said, this is not usually as simple as it is because at least from my experience, getting things translated into Spanish, there's usually a lot more words. So what might be like this in English sometimes comes back from the translation company like that. Okay, so you do have to also go potentially go back and make your layouts a little bit more flexible, and sometimes you even have to mess around with font sizes to make it all work. Okay, but.
But in most cases, it's as simple as that. Just give me a new translated file. And then you can work through the, the little tweaks and whatnot that you have to make for layout to make it work. Does that answer that question, Ben? You had posed that question? That makes sense? That's the big reason is the translations. It does give us this other things, but we wouldn't do it if it was just for that. We were doing it mostly for this. Okay. Um, and a reminder for Wednesday. I don't know who here is maybe interested or active in Phi Theta Kappa. They did say that there's an induction, induction ceremony for new members on Wednesday. It will be at noon at the Marion Main Technology Center. So just in case, just in case you're interested on that, we'll make sure you know about it. Let's get started with two point. So in lesson two, there's kind of three parts to this two point. So we're going to talk first today about activities and attempts, and you're kind of getting, again, an overview of a bunch of things. Uh, tomorrow we'll dive more into the life cycle of activities, of what happens as that goes through. You'll kind of see some mentions to it here, but we won't go very deep into it. Um, and then on Wednesday, we'll get into what we call implicit intents. Again, you'll see a brief overview here. We'll talk more about it Wednesday. Okay, this lesson actually is one of the big reasons why we're using this, this textbook instead of the Muroc textbook, um, because the Muroc textbook just didn't even really cover this stuff. Um, and as you can see, they put it as lesson two. It's pretty important. Um, you have to know this stuff if you want to make an app that has more than one screen. Um, if you want to stick with, if you if your app only has one screen, you don't really need to need, know this. But that being said, 99% of real world useful apps are going to have more than one screen. It's very hard to make a case for an app that only has one screen. Okay, so first of all, we'll talk a little bit more about activities. We'll talk about how you define activities and how you add new activities to your to your application. Um, then we're also going to start talk about how, okay, now you've added it to your project, how do you actually get it to switch screens? How do I get it from, I click this button, it goes to this other screen, okay? And then we also in that process need to talk about, well, okay, I can switch screens, but I also need to pass some data, right? So like, let's say I click on this article, well, I want to then go be able to look at the, the contents of that article on this other screen. Right? So I need to tell it which article is it going to show. Right? So there's a lot of reasons why we may need to pass data around. Um, and then we'll also at the end talk about navigating, specifically the navigation that's already built into the OS, namely the back button and also the up navigation. So we'll talk about those two types. So at a kind of high level overview, um, an activity is one kind of application component, okay? For now, it's the only one you know about, but as things go on, especially when we get into Unit 3, and where we're talking about doing things in the background, you'll see that there are other kinds of application components, okay? And they actually use some of these same things that we're going to talk about today, okay? Um, so you'll see some stuff today in Lesson 2. You'll see more of this stuff come back in a few weeks when we get to Unit 3. Okay. Um, every activity represents one really screen, as I would say. Okay. So it may be, it may be that it takes up a whole screen. That's kind of the norm, is, is your activity takes up a full screen. But it may also be that your activity is just a dialog that appears on top of another screen. Right. It can be a dialog box or it can be a full page screen. Either of those are both activities in the typical sense. Does that make sense? I understand that? So every, every activity that we build is going to be implemented with one Java class. There's a, there's a one to one relationship there. So what does the activity do? So um, or what is an activity, right? So an activity is, is one kind of thing that the user is doing. So let's say they want to order groceries, send email, get directions. Right, so I might put the, the screen, it might have 
have one screen in the app where they can pick out the groceries that they want. We might have another screen where they can write up an email. They might have another screen where they can get some sort of map that will tell them where your, your business is, right? So there's a bunch of different screens that you can write your app into. Um, the main job of your activity or that Java class is to handle the user interactions. There you take, okay, the user did this, now I do this, right? So your, remember your view, your layout file, is to represent how does the, do the controls look graphically, right? Where are they positioned, okay? And how do they lay out on different types of tablets and phones, right? Your activity on the back end is simply implementing all that business logic of, of what actually happens when the user does something, okay? So if you're thinking of things in kind of MVC terms, as we did last semester, right, our activity is sort of our controller, and our layouts are sort of our view, and then we'll get to our model later, which, as you can assume from last semester, model is really where we start talking about databases. Um, so we'll, we'll get to that in, in around unit four, is where we introduce that model. Um, so as far as what can we do with that, well, we can start activities, we can open screens either from our own app, or we can actually even open screens up from other apps, okay? So let's say you want to send an email. Um, from, you, you say, hey, well, here's my email address. Your app doesn't have to know how to send an email. You just say, I, I'm going to start the activity from their email app. I'm going to start their Gmail app. Right, so you tell the operating system, here, please start an email, start composing an email, and Android will figure out, oh, well, they have Gmail as their default application, so I'll send it over here and get started. Or let's say you need them to take a picture, right? Well, you tell the Android operating system, I need a picture. It'll open up their default camera app, take, they can take that picture then, and then they come back to your app. Um, so activities can be a lot more than just changing screens within your own app, it can actually be going to another standard app on their device to take pictures, to share data, whether it be through email or instant messenger as an SMS, as a text message, or through messenger, Facebook messenger, or the Facebook post. All of those things can happen through these intents, which we're going to talk about. Every application that we have that we work with will have a life cycle. Um, so at the beginning, it's created, which you'll see we've already done that on create method. Um, but there's also several other life cycle stages, which we'll talk about tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So it starts out being created, it ends up being destroyed. Um, but in that process, it can also be paused and resumed. So as you're moving between screens, let's say I, I click a button and it takes me to view an article. Well, I'm going to put that that screen that list of articles on pause while I'm reading the article. Does that make sense? So that I can come back to it later. Okay. So example activities that you might see. We've got the activity that we created already. You might have a list of food items. You might have a calculator. You might have a map. Right. So you have some examples there. Right. Activities are very, very flexible. Anything you can put on the UI, any screen, can be an activity. Um, it's also important to note that activities are loosely tied together, and they should be loosely tied. Okay? You want to make sure that you don't have a lot of dependencies between your different activities. Um, we really want to focus on having low, as we'd say, kind of technically, low coupling. Low coupling between activities. There shouldn't be a lot of code between activity A and activity B that kind of know about each other. Now, there are some things in there where we will have some coupling, but we want to keep it as low as possible. Okay, But there are some places where it's unavoidable. Okay. The first activity that the user receives uh, or, or enters into, we always call that the main activity. Okay, Main activity is the first activity that the user sees when they load your app from the icon. Okay, so when they click through your launcher icon, they're always going to be sent to the main activity. That's that's a matter of fact. There's not a way to change that. Okay. 
Um, we can also arrange our different activities in sort of a parent-child relationship. So we can say that, okay, here is the parent, the main activity, and then from there you can get to these other activities. So for instance, if I have a list of articles, my article list like might be my main activity, and then I might have a child activity to go actually view an article. Um, I might have another child from that to go edit the article if I'm some sort of author in there. I might also have in there, maybe as far as that main activity, I might also have a child activity that's go to log in, right? Maybe I need to log in so I can edit, right? So there are a lot of different relationships that we need to establish there. To tell the operating system, to tell Android how to get between those, okay? So every activity that we have is typically going to have a UI layout with. And I think everything we touch this semester, all the activities we create will have a layout file that goes with. There's a one-to-one -one relationship with that. That's very normal. Um, the only cases where you might not see that is something where you're maybe dealing with notifications or where you're dealing with some sort of uh, loading screen. Um, those are two cases where you might see an activity that doesn't have a layout that goes with it. Or you might see that with dialogues. Although it's usually best with a dialogue to still have a layout. Um, that layout is typically, again, defined with an XML file. And when the activity loads up or uses that, that layout file, we're saying, we, we call that inflation. We inflate the layout um, into the actual view objects. Okay. Um, and that term is important because it will come back up later, especially as we're talking about recycler views. Okay, that term inflation is pretty important. So how do we implement activities? How do we add a new activity? Okay, so if I want to have an activity, there's three main steps that I need to go through. Okay, so the first one, or here they, here they show them as four, the other document shows them as three, but the first one is we need to define a layout file. Okay. So for our first activity, we called that activity main, right? The typical naming convention is activity underscore name of activity, right? So if it was our order form, it might be activity underscore order underscore form, right? It's always going to start with activity underscore. Next thing we need to do is we need to define that Java class that goes with it. Again, there's a relationship there where usually there's one Java class to one layout file. Makes sense? So we need to create both of those th two things. And next we have to come back to the, the activity and implement that on create method where we call what method? What method do we call to link a layout with an activity? Huh? So it's in on create. But onCreate has to call a particular method. We did go through this last week. What method does it, if you create a brand new app, what method does it call in onCreate? Look at any of your examples, whether it be the, the Hello Toast. It's set content view, right? So the third step in there is we have to remember to call set content view. Okay. Then finally, when we do all that, I have to go back to the Android manifest file and define the activity. I have to add it will add an activity tag. Okay. So uh, if you don't do all these things, if you don't do all four of those steps, you won't have a let. You won't have a brand. You won't have a working activity. Does that make sense? If any one of those steps gets missed, you will not have a working activity. Um, so if you find that something's not working, you'll want to check all four of those places. Okay. Defining the layout, we've seen some of that already. I'm probably going to do that through the designer, but hey, it may look something like this if I have a relative layout with a single text sheet. You need to find that class. Remember the important thing. Remember when you create that class, 
it needs to be a subclass with app to path activity. Okay? You can't actually make it just a subclass of activity, uh, but it won't get some of the backwards compatibility with older versions of Android. Okay? So we're making a, a subclass of app to path activity, which means that it will handle all, a lot of things going back to Android API 7, if I remember right. <coughs> all the way back to API 7, if need be that. Okay. Now, things have changed a little bit in the past year. Okay. There's actually two app compatibility activity classes. Okay. So what was there, they have the same name, but they're in different namespaces. Okay. So remember when we create that project, remember there's a checkbox for Android X? Remember that? Mm -hmm. That's the newer version of app compatibility. That's the newer version of the support library. Okay. So there's an older version of the support library which we were actually using last year because Android X hadn't come out yet. Um, it's also called app to path activity. Micro Google has now deprecated that one. Okay. So if you use that one, if you look at the documentation, you'll see that that older app compatibility is now deprecated. So we're going to use the Android X version of App compatibility. Um, again, as you see, when we create that project, it will already pull on the new Android X one. It's actually going to do that for us. Um, but you just need to know that that has changed in the last year. So that there's a new version of that. Um, it works very similarly. Um, you hardly can't tell the difference. Um, but the thing you need to know is that old version of the support library is, is now deprecated. You're not suggested to use it. The new thing is Android X. Okay. So there's a method we need to add to, to our on create method. We can say set content view. And then like we were looking at previously, r.layout.activity name, right? So R for hey, this is a resource, what type of resource it is, it's a layout, and then there's the ID of the layout which is going to be the same as the name of that file. Okay. Did you just put any layout file in there? I put any layout file in there. Yeah. Hmm. Any layout file I, I want, I can put there. Um, but typically, you're going to have a one-to-one -one where your activity always gets the same layout. Mm -hmm. um, and because the way you want to do that switching is to use those folders. Like we showed you how to do a um, a landscape version versus a phone version, a tablet version, you want to let the Android operating system actually deal with changing that. Um, but you'll remember when we did that, all of those three layouts, the portrait, the, the default one, the landscape version, and the tablet, they all have the same file name. Okay? As long as they have the same file name, Android automatically switches. If you change to, hey, here's Android main portrait, Android main underscore land, well, they have two different lands, two different file names, then you now have to take on the switching yourself. Mm -hmm. Right? You generally want to avoid that because you're probably going to get it wrong. Okay. So remember, first thing I had to do is create a layout for the activity. I had to create a class for the activity. And now I have to hook it up in the manifest. Okay, so hooking up in the manifest is, is fairly simple. Under the application, I'm going to add another activity tag. I'm going to say Android May is equal to blah. So that's the name of my class, right? So in this class, in this case, I have main activity. If I called this order form activity, you would see dot order form activity there. Now the dot. The dot at the beginning means that this class is in the default namespace for my application. Mm -hmm. So the only case where you'd need to put something different there is if you put it in a different, if you put it in a different package. Mm -hmm. But if it's in the default, if it's in the default package, everything's in the default package, so then you just put a dot at the end. Yes. So I mean, I'm not gonna make the so that the the point of that is that makes it easier to not have a bunch of code duplications. Earlier versions of Android, you did have to actually always specify the package out. But newer versions of Android have now allowed us to just put a dot there. Okay. 
Um, the other thing you'll see under the main activity, um, you won't probably see this under your other secondary activities, but you will see this under the main activity, is an intent filter block. Okay. So this intent filter block is actually used to expose this activity to the Android operating system in a way that other apps can now access it. Okay. That's what this is about. Is allowing other apps, other parts of the system, to open up this activity. Okay, so here I'm saying that the action, the action that opens this this app, is the main action. Okay, the main action, and then I'm specifying a category which is which is always optional. That usually that usually what category you specify kind of goes with what action you're, you're specifying. Okay, these two things together that it's action main launcher, category launcher. Those two things, that says this is the this is the activity, this is the screen that you're going to go to when you click the, the icon on the launcher. Does that make sense? When I go try to open up the app, that's what tells it, is that intent filter block. Uh, you'll see a similar intent filter block if you were looking at, say, a camera app it would say, hey, if you want to take a picture, you can use this activity to, to take a picture. Or if you want to share something with somebody else, okay, well, here's my share activity, okay. So you'd see if you looked in YouTube, your messages app, or like um, Facebook Messenger, you would see a section, an intent filter here for that, that page where you share things, okay. So that's what that's about. So now that we've done those four steps, okay, that's the hard way to do it, is to do each of those steps manually. Okay, I would not recommend you do it the hard way. Let me show you the easy way. Because there's a one-step process in Android Studio um, that will do all four of those things for you. Okay, so. Right click on the project. Here I'm on Hello Toast. I'm going to say New. And you'll see there's a bunch of options in here, right? So if I if I choose Java class in here, I could say create a new Java class. We'll make that my activity. That is the the that's the that's the inefficient way where you're going to have to do all the work yourself. Don't do that. Um, you're gonna you're gonna waste a lot of work if you go that way. Um, so you can go that way, but it's not very efficient. So what you want to go down to is go down to activity here. Um, and then here are all those standard templates, right? So if I want to create a new act empty activity, I'm going to go here and click on empty activity. I can also go to gallery. Gallery is going to give me this option to pick which activity I want, kind of like you saw when we initially created the project. Okay. So I can do it that way, or I can just say, hey, I, I know I want an empty activity, so I'm going to go that route. So we're going to say new activity. I'm going to go to empty activity. Okay, It's going to give me a dialog like this. Okay, Well, it's asking me to give that new activity a name. right? So, so maybe I call this test activity. Okay. So I'm going to give it a name. Any guesses where this is going to be used? That's the, is that the name of layout or the name of the class? It's the name of the class, right? You can see because of the capitalization, right? It's camel case or, or Pascal case. So I'm going to put the name of the class here, test activity, and it's actually gone ahead and figured out the name of the layout for me said, yeah, you probably should call it activity underscore test. Um, or if I call this order form activity, see, it's gone ahead and figured out, oh, you're, you're, you're camel casing word form. You want that with separated by underscores. If I didn't do that, see, it all kinds of puts it as one word. So it's actually looking at your camel case to determine the name of the layout. So is it all always going to be prefixed with it should always be prefixed with activity. 
It's not per se required. Your app will work if it's not prefixed with activity, but you really should um, because at some point somebody else will need to look at your code and figure out what's going on and it will be a lot easier for them if you you start with that that prefix because um, otherwise it can be hard to tell which layouts are for activities and which layouts are for other things um, because yes you can have layouts for things that are not activities um, so that's that's why we we preface it that way is because down the road we'll have layouts for things that are not activities as well okay so that's really all you have to make sure that gets set there you have to make sure that the name of the activity gets set and the name of the layout file gets set. That's really all you care about on that dialog. Okay, so let's say, say finish. I'm just gonna ask if I wanna add this stuff to source control. Yeah, I definitely do. Um, and remember, that's just gonna queue it. It's not immediately uploading it. It's just saying, okay, yeah, I'll add it later. Um, so, if I look into here now, we can see that the order form activity is created. In fact, you can see it's already a subclass of vacuum pad activity. It's already taking care of that for us. It's already created an onCreate method, which is calling set content view with the new layout it created. So it's gone ahead and done all those all those steps for setting up your activity class for you. Right? We don't have to do that. Um, we can also go over to the layout folder and you can see that the layout file is here. Now it's, it's just a basic setup. There's nothing in there, right? Because we picked empty activity, the only thing there is an empty constraint layout. There's no controls, no text views, no buttons. We need to put all that in there, okay? But it's created the layout and given it a good name. It's created the activity class and given it a good name. And in fact, if we look at the manifest file, Note that under the application, it's already put it in there, right? So I already have order form activity into the manifest. So it's done all four of those steps if I just create it the right way, right? Make sure that you're doing that. Make sure that when you, when you create a new activity, go add new activity, empty activity. Because um, again, if you go, you can go add new class, but now you have to, if you do add a new class, you're going to have to do all this work yourself. Does that make sense? And you're more likely you're going to miss one of these steps. It is a kind of component. Um, so when we deal with um, Android apps, there's really three kinds of components that we deal with. Um, there are activities there are services and there are broadcast receivers okay now services and broadcast receivers both of those we'll talk about in unit three okay so we won't talk about those for a while um, but all three of those are considered components does that make sense um, so any component that we have in our app we have to declare here so that includes all three of those types have to be declared under the application tag So does that make sense? Adding a new activity is relatively easy as long as you take the simple route. Otherwise, you're going to take five to 15 minutes to do the same thing. Um, so, and then intent. Intent's a really important concept, concept in Android, okay? And intent is an object that we use to tell the Android operating system to do something, okay? Now, I say that real general because it is that general. It's to do something. Um, so we can do a lot of stuff with an intent. Okay. So an intent we can use to request any other application component in the system. That includes all the three, all three components that I just mentioned. Okay. Not uh, just activities. So we, we create the intent, we send it to the app operating system, and then Android does something with it. Okay, we'll do what we asked for. Or it'll throw an error and say, throw an exception to say, hey, you didn't give me a good intent. Okay. 
So we have this idea of, of the intent and then an action that gets performed. So some intents that we can send might be to start an activity. So we click a button and that creates a new activity where we can go do further work. Again, like looking at an article. Okay. Or clicking on a share button, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So we can start another activity or, or, or open another script or dialogue or whatever. We can also start a service to do some work in the background, like downloading a file in Python. So it's like, okay, we got that going, we'll let you know I'm done. Um, you can also deal with broadcasts that way. Um, broadcasts are for things that are kind of system wide. So, for instance, if you plug your phone into charge, you'll get a notification that it's now charging. Or as the battery state goes up or down, there's also a notification about, oh, it's now 10%, it's now 9%, it's now 8%. So you can watch for changes in the battery state. You can also listen for, oh, it's disconnected from Wi-Fi or it's connected to Wi-Fi. So you know whether you're, you're online or offline. That's one of probably the most useful things to do. Um, there's also a notification in there that you can, you can get when the phone heats up. Right? So there's a lot of different broadcasts that we'll talk again about. These two things are really we'll talk about in the next lecture. But the one I want you to focus on is that first one, which is what we're talking about this week, is how do you start new activities. Okay. So when we create an intent, we have two options. We can create what's called an explicit intent or an implicit intent. So when we create an explicit intent, we're telling it exactly what to do. We want to say, I want to open up this activity class. Okay. Explicit intents we only use for our own app components. If we're working with, if we're working within our own app, we use an explicit intent. If we need to access something in another app, we'll use an implicit intent. Okay. So like a share button is going to be to another app, we would use an implicit intent. If you wanted to say take a photo, well that photo app is probably that camera app is going to be another application, so we'd use an implicit intent there, right? So an explicit intent is for our own app within our own app, we're going to access our own components. But if we want to access somebody else's components, then we use an implicit intent. So implicit intents we'll talk more about here and more about on Wednesday. Okay. The main thing we're focusing though on the explicit intent. So it depends, right? So if it we if it stays within the Canva app, it is and it's it's part of the Canva app, it's an explicit intent. Okay. If it leaves and goes to like your standard camera app yeah. on your phone, then it's an implicit intent. Okay. Towards the end of this, one, I'll show you how to, there's, there's the button, you can look at which tasks are running, um, and that can be some sort of indication of whether or not it's an implicit or explicit intent, because if, if, it's, if it's an explicit intent, it typically, it can stay in your own app, so it's going to stay in that same task, but usually an implicit intent was going to cross into another task or another program, so you can kind of see that by, based on the task. The programs that are running. So, yeah. So when we when we create an explicit intent, I'm going to say, okay, I want to go see the shopping cart activity, or I'm going to say I want to go open the the order form activity. I'm going to tell specifically which activity to open. Versus here, I'm just going to say I want to share something, and ask the user what they want. To what the Atlanta documents is and ask them how they want to share. Yeah. So is that how you can like pass data to different activities? You're using an explicit intent? I can pass data both of these ways. It doesn't actually matter. Okay. So whether I'm doing an implicit intent or explicit intent, I can pass data. Um, because let's say I want to do let's say the explicit intent, I want to go read the article. Well I need to know which article I'm reading. Right, so I might send the article ID through as data, mm -hmm. right? Versus here, I want to say, okay, um, I want you to share this video. 
right, from YouTube. Well, I have to tell it which video I want to share. So I might send a URL as data, right? So both of these cases can have data, okay? Whether or not it has data is not the difference between exclusive and exclusive. The difference is I'm telling it here, use this app component. Here I'm letting the Android system figure out which component to use. So to start an activity, the simple basic version is actually a, is just a two-step process. I need to create an intent, and then I need to call start activity with that intent. Okay. So to create the intent, I'm going to say new intent. It takes two to create an explicit content, okay, because we talked about the different constructor for implicit contents, content for in intents. But for explicit intents, we're going to say, first, I need the context. Remember, this refers to the activity, because I'm writing this inside an activity. So I'm saying new intent, give the context, and then the class. This is which activity I want it to go to. So this is going to open up activity name. So this is referencing the current activity. The current activity. And the activity I want, and then I've got the activity I want to go to. Okay. All right, so here's the activity I'm on, there's the activity I want to go to. And then within the activity, I'm going to call start activity and give it that intent. So start activity is how I actually tell it to switch activities. And this start activity works whether or not it's explicit or implicit, it can take any kind of what makes it implicit or explicit is how I define this intent. Does that make sense? Okay. So if I want to create an implicit intent, I'm going to use a slightly different construct. I'm still going to say new intent, but I have to give it two things. So the first thing I have to give it is an action, which is a string. And there's a bunch of standard constants in the Android API, which we'll put there, right? So we'll put a standard action string there that will give us a thing. And we give it a URI. A URI is sort of like a URL, but it's a little bit more general. Okay. Um, so we'll give it basically the, the string, and then this URI object, which will tell it which document or which thing. And then again, I call start activity. So again, whether it's explicit or implicit, the last step is always going to be start activity. But, yep. Yeah. You always only have one intent on each activity? What do you mean? Like you would never declare more than one of those? So I'm going to clear this intent. We'll always declare this intent inside of the handler that makes it happen. Right. I don't declare these as, as member variables. I don't want to keep these around for a long time. Mm -hmm. I just want to declare them immediately at the time I need them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if I have an activity, I might have three buttons on there. I might have a camera button and a share button and a button to view the article. Mm -hmm. Those three buttons are going to send different intents. Right. So they're going to create their own intent objects and I'm going to call start activity with those. So let's say I want to show a web page. Okay. So here's how I would set that up. First of all, I'm going to take, hey, I want to go to acpgoogle.com. I'm going to parse that. Okay. So parsing it turns it into a URI object or a string to a URI object. Okay. Then I can now create the intent. And I'm going to say intent action view URI. So this intent action view is a constant, right? That's the, the standard constant that I use if I want to show a document. So if I want to open something up in the web browser, I say intent action view, and then give it the URL to go over. Does that make sense? So if I want to do, if I want to use the dialer, want to make the app dial a phone number, well then I'm going to do a similar thing here. I'm going to start with tell colon phone number. I'm going to say URI parse, 
Again, this is going to turn this into a URI object. And then I'm going to create the intent, but it's with a different action. So here I've got a, a URI that's a phone number. Here I've got a URI with the URL. Here I'm saying action view. Here I'm saying action dial. Right? So this is going to open up my, my phone app. This is going to open up my web browser. If I've got more than one web browser, right? Let's say I have um, Firefox and Chrome and Opera in my phone. Well, it's going to give me a pop-up and say, which one do you want? Do you want to use this one, that one, that one? And then I can say, well, by default, I want to use Chrome, but then we're not going to from there. So that's what you're seeing anytime you're seeing a pop-up that's asking you which app you want to use. That's because there's an explicit intent happening. Well, I've seen like 10 app browsers. Would that be using explicit or implicit? Depends. So what do you mean by in-app browsers? Like it's still in the app, but it's just like a pop-up. Kind of. And you can scroll through it. Okay. It all depends. Can you be more specific? Which app are we talking about? Uh, I don't know the top of my head, but okay. I just remember like it was like a link and then it popped up the browser. Okay. The answer is sometimes it's implicit and sometimes it's explicit. It, it really depends on how they've set it up. So there are some apps that have that, like let's say you want to pick an image. Well, some of those are built into the app. And they're using an explicit intent and, and to create that pop-up dialog. And some of them are outside of the app and they're using an implicit intent. So I think if I remember right, the normal text message app is using implicit intents for most things. Right, I'm sorry, explicit intent, because the, the normal file selector is there. Um, but let's say I wanted to take an image from Google Drive and put it in the text message, right? Well, then there's an implicit intent because in order to get it from Google Drive, that's another app, I have to go over to Google Drive and come back to the text message app. Does that make sense? So it may even depend on where you're getting the image from. So if I'm getting the image from Google Drive, I need an implicit intent. If I'm just getting it from my phone, the text message app will just straight up do that internally to the app. So how do activities run kind of given all of this? So I start at the beginning. Here I'm in the main home screen of your phone, your little home launcher. I click on the icon. So I click on the icon in the launcher. It's going to go ahead and say, well, let's, let's start this app. Okay, so the Android operating system picks that up. It goes, looks at your, your manifest file and says, oh, your, um, the one that you could declare as main launcher is main activity, so I'll open up main activity in a brand new tab. Okay, so we open up main activity. In main activity, you click a button to select, this is maybe ordering from a restaurant. You want to pick which food you're going to order? Well, okay. So you click on the button, you say, let's open food list activity. Okay, so I go here, gives me a whole list of food. I pick one of those. And it's going to go and take me over to the order activity. Okay, so in the order activity, I can say, okay, yeah, I want to order that cheaper. Right? But along that process, I just I keep sending intents every time I want to change activities. Does that make sense? So we send the intent to the OS. The OS then opens up the activity. So a lot of times when I open up an activity, again, this is whether it's explicit or implicit, I want to send along data. Okay. There's actually two ways to pass data with a URI, sorry, with, a, the, with an intent. Okay. So either I can pass it as data. Um, data can only be one piece, one string, sorry, one URI. It can only be one URI. It has to be kind of in that URI form. Okay. Now, that's used most, as we've kind of seen 
with impulsive intent. Okay, so if I've got an impulsive intent, if I've got something that's coming from another app that is communicating with me now, you're going to see this data used much. Okay. I can also, whether or not I choose to add push things to the data, I can add extras. Okay. Extras are a key value map, right? Remember we talked about maps earlier in the second week. Um, I can cast this whole map, which is actually a bundle, um, and that allows me to say, okay, I want the um, the password is one, two, three. I can add additional things. Okay, so extra is all this additional data that I want to add, or or more general, I want to be more flexible and, and cast it through. So most of the times when we are starting up new activities and we want to give it additional things, additional pieces of information, nearly all of that stuff that we pass along is going to be extras. Um, there's very we won't be doing nearly as much in data. Okay, so usually extras is, is the, actually the right way to pass your data. So kind of a rough outline of how this works. You're going to start with two activities. Okay, so we have one that's the sending activity, and we have one that's the receiving activity. Right? So your first activity, your second activity. Okay, so in the first activity, the sending, we're going to create a new intent object. Do we want to add any of the data or extras to that intent? And then we're going to say start activity. That's basically all we need to do from the, the sender side. Okay? Create the intent, add in the extras, pass it along. That's where we, we leave it. Okay? And then the receiving activity, we can get that intent pull out the extras and do what we need to do with it. Okay. Important thing to note, when in the sending activity, that sending activity is going to be paused as this is happening. Okay. So, so it's going to be kind of on hold until we come back. Still be active, but it will be paused. So let's say I want to set, I want to pass through data. I might say intent.setData, and here I'm giving it a URL. So I, if I want to pass in a URL, I might pass it that way. If I want to say pass a path to a file, I'm going to start with SD card, sample CHA, so it's going to be like the root of my SD card, and create a file, and then that file I'm going to turn into a URL. Either way, I'm passing a URL. That's the only thing that's valid. To pass through as data if it's in the URL. Um, and a reminder, whatever I set as set data, there can only be one thing. So whatever last set data call that I have, that's what this is going to be in. Okay. So I call it more. Okay. Extras. So if I want to put extras into my intent, I'm going to use the put extra method. Um, the first Entry to put extra, the first argument is always a string, always the key or the name of that extra. Okay. Um, the second argument can be a variety of things. It can actually be any primitive type. Um, it, there's, a, there's a particular overloaded version for each of those. Or it can be an object as long as it implements parsable. Right. If I remember right, that would be. So let's say I want to pass in this integer. So here I'm going to say, take the intent, call put extra. I'm going to call the extra, the name of the extra is level, and then the value is 406. So I'm going to say put extra, level 406. Let's say I want to put in a list of strings, okay? And these are ingredients. So I'm going to take uh, an array of strings, create it here. Rice, beans, and fruit. And I'm going to say put extra food in that string array. So all I need to know basically on the front end is whoever's sending it, you call put extra and give it a name and a value. And the value being anything? The value can basically be anything. Um, the one thing I would advise you against is passing whole objects. 
So like casting a whole user object is not a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Casting a whole order object is not a good thing to do. Passing a list of a million entries is not a good thing to do. Okay, uh, the thing you need to understand about these intents um, is they have to be kept around in the Android operating system, whether on disk or in memory. Okay, so everything you put into this intent is now eating up memory until that screen goes away. Okay, so you don't want to put a lot of things in there. You want to keep it as minimal as possible. So if I'm passing it, if I if I want it to give me a, a like an edit screen for a user, I'm just going to give it the user ID. I won't give it the user object. I was wondering if so, like the purpose of that is so that if you're using another feature on the Android, so like you need to connect to another app, mm -hmm. is do it with like the assumption that another app could use the other extra information you're passing to it. No, it's because your app may be running for a long time. Yeah. You're, you know, maybe the user leaves your app and goes to another app, even if they, even without an implicit intent, they might just say, oh, I need to take a break from this and go watch a YouTube video. Well, yeah. as they're watching that YouTube video, that app, that app is effectively still open. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, when, if you leave an app for a while, or you kind of leave your phone alone for a while, it may eventually decide to destroy the actual activity, um, but it will actually still keep the intent okay, yeah. as a way to kind of resume the activity. So these intents may actually get saved to like files um, if, if you leave the activity for a long time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or if the system reboots, it will actually save all of your intents to disk, and then when you come back and try to restart, get back into that app where you were, it will actually load it back up using those intents. So you want to keep, again, you want to keep those as small as possible, and it's better to keep an ID in there also for the reason that you don't want it to come back in there with stale data. Right? So if you take, or let's say you're reading an article, you take the entire text of that article and put it into the intent, right? Well, if somebody needs to go edit that article, that's not going to be reflected, right? If I put the article ID in there, then more likely if I come back to that app, it's going to update and boot a new text. Does that make sense? So you really want to avoid putting a lot of data, um, whatever it may be, into that intent. You want to keep it as minimal as possible. So most of the time, all you need is an ID and maybe like a mode to say, hey, we're creating an article or we're editing an article. Um, there is also a method called put extra. So put extra puts a single extra in there. Put extra replaces all of the extras that you already have. So this can be used if you read through the article in this chapter. It'll kind of walk you through on how you would set that up. I would strongly advise you guys avoid this with extras. Um, I would I would really suggest doing this. They do kind of say here if there's lots of data, then use that. Well, you shouldn't have lots of data. That doesn't have anything to do with it. Your data should be there for that. So if you have more than two or three things you're setting, you probably have too much. So a simple example here, I'm going to create a constant in my activity class. I'm going to call it extra message key. Okay. All of your constants for extras should start with extra underscore. Again, they don't have to, but it's convention. Um, so you say extra underscore there. The other thing that you'll see in here is I've got the name of the app. Okay. So you will put the name of your app in here as part of that script. So here we've got com.example.android.2xreviews.extra.message, right? So for us, that might be, if I were to create this, I would say edu.rankin.prsmith.2activities.extra. 
or if this is hello test, they would say hello test Is there a method to get that shirt? This you still want a hard fit, honestly. You would still best to, to still recommend a hard fit this rather than which may seem kind of counterintuitive, but the, the trick is basically take these and put them all into one file rather than splitting them all around a bunch of files. Um, but yeah, it's recommended that you hard code that package thing. Um, so we create the console, and then when I want to open the second activity, I'm going to say create the new intent. Again, I need to give it a context and tell it to open up second activity. Okay, so I'm going to say open up second activity. I say put extra and use my constant here, extra message P. I'm going to say pass in the message hello activity. Okay, and then the throw activity. So that's what I'm doing on the sender side. Right? Does that make sense? So if I wanted to say open up an article, I might put the text of the article or the ID of the article, right, as an action. Okay. So on the side that retrieves it, right, so that we saw how to send it, on the sending side we call put extra for set data. On the retrieving side, I'm going to say, well, get data. I can say, grab the intent and say, get data. That's going to turn me the URI that they put in. Or I can say, get extra. Now, there's a bunch of different versions of get extra. So here we've got get int extra. So int extra allows me to extract it as an int if it's been put in with an int. Okay. So if I put it in as, a, as, as an int, which I did previously, I called set level. And set put extra and gave it a level as, as like four of six. So this takes the name of the extra and then what the default value is. So the default value is what it's going to use if that extra hasn't been set. Does that make sense? If the if the activity that tried to oh, the if the if that intent, the sender, didn't have this extra then use that default value. So here I'm saying grab the level using get int extra, the name of that, name of that extra is level, the default value is zero. So if they didn't specify that extra, I'm going to get zero. So what if you pass the level to double in the retrieving nature? What would happen? I would get zero. If it's any other type. In fact, if I put this in as a string and I try to retrieve it as an int, I'm going to get zero. Okay. I'm going to get that default value. Okay. If I put it in as one type and try to retrieve it as another, it will not try to convert it. It's just going to give me the default value. You put it in as a string and try to retrieve it as an int, you're going to get the default value. You put it as an int and try to retrieve it as a string, you get the default value. It will not do any conversion. So you have to make sure that the type that you're putting it in is also the type you're extracting as. Okay, and that can actually be a little bit um, not obvious depending on how you write your code. Because uh, I have seen people where, I have seen some students who did it last year, they put it in as a string, we treat it as an int, or they put it in as an int, we treat it as a string. Lo and behold, it doesn't work. <laughs> so we've got get intra, get int extra for integers, we've got um, get String extra for strings. I do believe there is a get double extra, um, but there aren't actually versions for all data types, um, if I remember right. So I don't think there, if I remember right, I don't know that there's a boolean version. I don't think there's a short. I don't think there's a byte. It's it's relatively simple. So would you put this as the on create method, or would you put it as something else? Okay. So let's. That's a really good question. So first of all, where would I put this? Well, this I would ha put in a handler of some sort. I put this in, say, on click, right? This is what happens when the user clicks on a button, right? So I put that there. This part here, I would put yes in on create. The part, the, the, the receiver, that part is going to be in on create. 
Um, so in on create, the first thing I need to do is actually call get intent. Get intent will retrieve me whatever intent that I was started with. And that way I can call, so I can call get intent, grab the intent object, and then grab get intent, call get index drag, etc. to actually retrieve the data from me. Does that make sense? I think if I look at pull it up here. I don't know, I don't think they have they don't, I didn't see it on the slide, but they did have an example of it in here. No, they didn't actually have an example here. No, so they didn't have an example. I thought that they did. Yeah, so that's the that's the example that they have. Yeah, so we say intent is equal to get the intent that we were started with and grab the data and get string extra etc so what would happen if you put in a method what do you mean if you put in a method that you had you really do always want to put it in on um, technically you could put it other places but you always really only want to put this logic in on create and then save that value to some member variables. So the rest of your code should really refer to those member variables, not the original intent. Does that make sense? That's the kind of the convention. Is on create saves it, saves it to member variables, and from there you use the member variables. Okay, so let's take a quick break and come back at 2 o'clock so we can finish this up. Okay, so we finished up talking about, hey, how do I, how do I send data to an activity? How do I get data back, right? So remember, that's going to be primarily through these extras. So I'm going to say put extra to put data in. And I might say um, get int extra, get string extra to pull the data out. Okay. Now, if I, in some cases, um, this is not the common case, but in some cases I may want to go to an activity and then that activity kind of send me data back, right? And kind of think of it as a, as a function call where I call the function, give it some parameters, and then I want to get data back. Okay. So in order to do that, I need to not only send an intent to that cert to that activity, I also need to send an intent back. Okay. So to do that, we use something, we use a method called start activity for result. So instead of just calling start activity, I call it start activity for result. The normal use case for this would be something like using a camera app. You want it to go take a picture and then send the picture back to us. Okay. So that's the most common case that you would see for something like this, is, is either taking a photo or taking a video card. And you go there and then get data back. So to return the data back from the second activity, um, in that second activity, we need to create a new intent. Um, and then we put the data that we need to send back into extras, kind of like we saw before. We say put extra, okay? And then I'm going to say set the result to either okay, the result code to either result okay or result canceled. So result okay saying everything went good, here's your data. Result count canceled saying either the user decided not to do it or something went wrong. But either way, I failed. You don't have your data. So we need to send that back. Okay. And then thirdly, so we first thing we do, again, we've started the activity with 
start activity for result. We've, we've created this intent and, and set it um, as the result. And then we've called finish to close the activity. So if you see the word finish in there, that method is used to close the activity. Okay, it means it's gonna remove from the back stack, which we'll talk about in a minute. Okay. And the last thing I need to do, going back to the original activity, I need to implement the on activity result method. So that on activity result method is gonna receive the result of that, the resulting intent. Kind of like on create, a little bit. It's another. It's another method in there that we go on. So start activity for result. Start activity result takes two things. First of all, it takes an intent. The intent's really the same thing that we've been talking about. It also takes a request code. Now that request code has to be an integer. Okay. And we can decide whether what whatever integer we want that to. Okay. So usually we're going to pick one, two, three. And, and the basic way that we use that is we use that for different kinds of requests. So if the user has the option to use a camera app to take a photo, that would be maybe request code one. If they have the ability to share the, the post or a photo, that might be request code two. If, they, if they're going to go do something else, that might be request code. So it's, it's based on what kind of thing they're doing. So we're gonna send a different intent also going with those different request codes. The reason we have those different request codes is so that when we come back, we know what kind of request we're dealing with. Because we've, at that point, we've lost the original intent. Okay. So first of all, we're gonna, first thing we need to do in here, so it's, yeah, sorry, for what it's gonna do in here, we're gonna create, it's gonna start that activity, normally using that intent, it's going to go ahead and save that request code in there for later for when we come back. We need to, yeah, and then we're going to get the data back through an intent using those extras. Um, when we're done, we quote unquote pop the stack, and we'll see that in another slide, which means that we're going to remove that activity that we just created from the system, we're going to throw it away and destroy it. Um, and then we're going to come back to this activity, call on activity result. And then in at, on activity result, we'll have both of that request code and we'll have the result code, whether it was okay or canceled. We'll have both of those pieces of information. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a constant in my original activity for the request codes. Okay. So in this code, in this case, I've got two scoop requests. That's the name of my constant. It's equal to one. Convention here, remember extra starts with extra underscore request code and with underscore request. So I'm going to say create new create the create new intent. It's just a regular explicit intent intent here. So I've got context, I've got the activity I want to open, and I say, instead of saying start activity, I say start activity for result, okay? And then instead of just passing the intent, like I would with start activity, I also give this code. So start activity, intent. So then when we go into the activity, when the activity is done, and we need to go back to the original, we're going to write some code like this. So we're going to create a new intent. Remember, this is different than the intent that I sent. So I have one intent to create the activity and one intent to send back the result. So it's kind of like a response to that? Maybe. Maybe this is our response. Right? This is our response as well. So I'm going to create this new intent. Note that I'm not passing anything in here that can start this entity. I'm not giving any context. I'm not giving any class. I'm not giving any sort of action or URI because it's going to go back to whoever called this activity, whoever started this activity. Okay, so I'm 
back and not go forward. Okay. And then I'm going to say put the extra in here. So here I've got another constant called extra apply. And I'm going to put in that extra. So here I'm saying, well, let's put this string that you can pick and type in, put it in the extra, we'll send it back. Okay. So I've created the intent. I've called put extra, put data into it. And then here's the important call is set result. So you're going to say set result takes two things. It takes either OK or cancel. And then it takes the reply intent, the intent that you're going to send. Okay. If I don't call set result, by default, it's going to be OK cancel. Then it will be a null for the reply intent. Does that make sense? So by default, if the user just hits back, we're going to get canceled. And then I'm going to say finish, which effectively does the same thing as hitting the hit back arrow. It says close the current activity and go back to the previous thing. Any questions? So is that like a redirect? Sort of. Um, it redirects in the sense that it redirects you to a previous activity on your history. Right? It's just kind of like hitting the back button on your web browser and doing it that way. So finish closes the current activity, gets destroyed. And finish will always destroy that current activity. It won't get preserved, it gets destroyed. Okay. So when we come back to the original activity, okay, remember we've got on create and such where we're overriding an existing method. So here we're overriding the on activity result method. Okay. It needs to take three parameters. This is a required signature we're overriding. So it returns nothing, it's void. It takes first the request code, the result code, and then the data. This intent is that data, that reply intent will be created in any other, any other activity. So that'll come back here. Okay? So then I need to make sure I call the parent class so it can do whatever it needs to do with that intent. Okay? So on activity, we're, we're going to call super. Remember, that's the parent class, or the base class, the super class. On activity result, so we're overriding that method. And then we're going to say pass in the same three things. So it's going to get a chance, whoever's in the parent class is going to get a chance to run before we do our work. Now what we're doing in our subclass, we're saying if the request code is text request, which is the one we sent in the beginning, so if it's text request, then OK, let's keep going. If it's the result code is OK, meaning it succeeded, it didn't fail, OK, let's keep going. You can easily combine these two with an AND and say request code is equal to text request and result code is equal to result OK. In reality, if you have more than one um, request code, it's probably a good place for a switch. Mm -hmm. um, I would still keep an if at this lower level, but the outer level is not going to switch if you've got a bunch of request codes. Um, so assuming that we got this was from a text request and it was all good, let's grab the reply that we sent. So we're going to take the, the data, the intent, right, that we sent back. We're going to say get string extra, grab that extra reply. Mm -hmm. Then it wouldn't do anything, and that's all, right? So if it's if it's canceled, we just want to stay where we were, act as if nothing happened, just go back to your normal work, because that's what the user is going to expect. If if you cancel it, you hit the back arrow. They said, oh, I, I didn't actually want to do that. Let's 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 go back. I changed my mind. So typically for cancel, no, you don't do anything. That's intentional. So, let's talk about navigation. Now, we've kind of talked about the code that you use to go from one activity to another, whether you, whether, you, and so whether you need a result back, whether you don't need a result back. Again, the most common cases, not needing a result back. It does happen sometimes, like, again, if you're trying to get a photo taken or a QR code, you might do that, but most of the time, you're not going to get a result back. So, 
in Android, there's something we call the activity stack, okay, or the back stack. Um, so whenever we start a new activity, we put it on the stack. Whenever we leave an activity, we take it off the stack. Okay, so it kind of stacked up like a piece of paper, like a bunch of paper in a in a bin. Um, if I take the top one off, then I go down to the one below, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I can only ever really see the one that's at the top of the stack. That makes sense. They may all be run, all these screens may be running, but the only one the user actually sees is the one at the top of the stack. Okay. So if I press the hardware back buttons, this is always going to pop that stack and go back a step. Okay. So let's look at an example here. So let's say we start out at the beginning. Again, we have our restaurant app. User starts starts the app for the first time, so we're going to start at the main activity. And start start down here at the at the bottom with main activity, and that's the only thing that's in this stack. Okay. Now, the user decides to click on the button to say, "Hey, I want to actually order some food." So there, we're going to send them to the food list activity. Okay. So they click on that button. We start a new activity. All right, now we're in food list. So right now, this is what's on our back stack. Okay. Main has been paused. Food list is now active. Okay. Now they want to, okay, we've picked a food. We want to add it to our cart. All right, so let's show, let's send them off to the cart now that they've added a burger. Right, so now the bur their cart is going to show that they have a burger in it. Okay, so far so good. Well, they decide they want to go add some fries. Okay, so we we go back, we pop the cart activity off the stack. We go back to food list. Okay, user picks some fries. All right, they pick the fries. We go back up to cart again. And now what do we have in the cart? We have a burger and fries. Right? And you see how that kind of works out. So does it get destroyed when uh, you go back? And it was... gets destroyed when you go back. Yeah. So cart got destroyed when we went back here. We created a brand new activity when we came here. Okay. So one activity got this one cart one instance of cart activity got destroyed. Probably calling finish. Mm -hmm. And then we went back here and recreated a brand new one. Because if you didn't create cart and you just went back to the original one, it wouldn't have been in fries, right? You can't go back to the original one. Okay. It's been destroyed. It doesn't exist like anymore. If thing, if it wasn't destroyed. You can't go back to it. The only way to leave it is to destroy it. Okay. There's only two ways to leave a screen. Either you put another thing on. Well, there's three ways. You either go back, which is you destroy it, you put another thing on the stack, right, which means it keeps growing, or you switch to another app. Right? There's no kind of reusing After. that. Where would the cart be pulling it to? Well, the cart would probably pull it from a database or a file on your system. Right? It probably more than likely would be pulling it from a local database of some sort. We could potentially have the have the data stored in food list and kind of pass it as an extra, mm -hmm. but more than likely it would end up being stored in, a, in an actual database. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, there are other ways to do that. Um, so in the cart, now I've added these two items in there. I decide I want to now place my order. Right? So I've got my burger and fries on the cart. I'm going to click on order. There you go. As you, to your previous point, I can't just go back to food list and leave cart on the stack. Okay, that makes sense. The only thing that can be active is the thing on top. So I go to order. Once I finish ordering, 
where's a sensible place to send them? Well, they place their order, we want to send them all the way back to Maine. Does that make sense? So once they finish their order, we're going to chop off everything on top and send them back to the main activity. Does that make sense? The important thing to understand there is A, first of all, you don't want this to grow infinitely. Um, you will run out of memory and eventually your activity will crash. Eventually your app will crash if you do not close activities as you're going along. They do consume enough. They do consume enough memory that you can crash it out by having too many to do so. What, what if you want the main to order? Does that not work? Well, can I? What happens if I go from main to order? Um, well, it kind of depends on where I'm storing the data, doesn't it? Right. So if I'm storing it in some other, if I'm storing it in a database, maybe I could. Maybe from main I could have a button that directly takes me to the order screen. More than likely it's probably going to take me to the cart screen, right, is the way I'd set it up. I'd have a button to the shopping cart on your main screen. I probably wouldn't have a button directly to order. But I could. I could. Right? I could have a button on here that directly takes me to order. Right, but the thing you remember is this this activity stack is keeping track of how you got there. Right, so if I go directly from main order, I'm not going to have all those stacks, I'm not going to have all those activities in between. If I went directly from the main screen to the order screen, it's just going to look like that. Right, so when I click back, I'm going to go back to main, I wouldn't go back to cart. keeping track of how you got there, in a sort of temporal sense, as we might say. Okay. Now, um, when we're looking at your device, okay. let me pop up an emulator so we can see this. And, and you can even do this on your physical device. This doesn't have to be an emulator, but I'm going to do it on emulator because that's easiest to show. Okay. All right, so I'm in Hello Toast right now, right? Let's go back to the home screen. I'll click a little circle, go back to the home screen, and let's say I open up the calculator. Okay, so I've got the calculator open, and I've also got my Hello Toast program kind of running in the background, right? Well, if you click the little square button, I can actually go through these and see all the different applications that I've got running. In this case, I've got actually a few running, right? So here is here is Hello Toast. Here's my calculator. Right? So I can actually switch between of these here. Well, every, every item that you see on this list is what we refer to as a task. Okay, So every item here is a task. So here we've got Hello Toast as a task. We've got the calculator as a task. I've got scrolling text as a task. Every program you have running runs in a task. Okay, So a task is one container like this. It's one back stack. So every program that's running has its own back, back stack. Does that make sense? They have their own bins. So if I go do something in my calculator, you'll keep track of what screens I've been to. If I do it in my Hello Toast application, it'll keep what, track of what, what screens I've been to. But those are separate, right? So me clicking back is based on which which application I've been. Do they get paused like once you switch to it? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. So so if I go to my calculator right now, all my other apps are paused. If I switch back now, I've paused my calculator. Okay. Now I've resumed Hello Toast. 
So anytime I leave that activity, whether because it's an intent or the user did it, I'm pausing that other activity. Does that make sense? The user can pause it or you can pause it. From your code. So in Android, there's actually two ways to navigate through your activity. Okay? So the first one, what we just talked about, is what we call temporal navigation. Okay? So we're going back in time. Right? We're going back to where you were in time. And that goes through, if you put the back arrow on the device, that will always be going through temporal navigation, okay? which just pops the last item off your stack and goes to what's beneath it. Okay. If we pop the last one, so we pop order and we pop main, well, there's nothing left in that stack, right? So typically it's going to go back to your home screen. So typically if we go past, back from there, it's typically going to end up going back to our home screen. Okay. In some cases, it may actually switch to your previous app because you wrote in that app from another app. So most of the time we'll go back to okay. So that's temporal navigation. We've also got ancestral or what's known as up navigation. Okay. So that appears in your action bar. So let's say I was on another screen that wasn't the main activity. There would be a little arrow here, left arrow. That button is what we refer to as up navigation. Okay which can be different than the actual back key on the device. Does that make sense? So up navigation, the way do we declare that, that actually goes by the parent-child relationships in your manifest. Okay, so in your manifest, you can hard code it and say, these two, um, these two screens have a parent-child relationship, so if they go back, well, here's what screen I want you to go to. Okay, and that usually is roughly the same thing as the behavior that you would expect from the back arrow, but not always. It's not actually necessarily the same. In fact, usually that up navigation will take you back a little bit farther um, than the back arrow does. So we talked a little bit about the back stack. Again, the back stack preserves all the history from what of where which screens that we've gone through recently, and it keeps track of how did we get to the current screen that we're on. Okay. And then that's kept track of for each task. For each running program, you have a different back stack. Okay. So switching between tasks also switches us between those back stacks. So I can go to my calculator, hit back, it will do one thing, and then I can go back to Hello hello Toast, and that will do another thing. I, or I can go to Facebook and hit back, or I can go to Chrome and do back, or they're going to keep separately track of where I'm at and where I've been. So up navigation always goes to the parent of whatever activity I'm on. Okay, and it's it's not flexible in the state where it can I can say well sometimes go here sometimes go there. It's if I hit the up arrow it will always go to a particular activity. Okay, so the way that I define that is in the manifest. So remember we defined a second activity earlier. We created an activity tag underneath the application tag. So the name of the activity class is what I've got here. So in this case, I've got the show dinner activity. So the show dinner activity, and then I've added another attribute called parent activity name. So the parent of this show dinner activity is main activity. Okay. So what that means, just changing this, if I don't specify, there won't be any up arrow at all. It'll look like this screen right here. Notice there's no up arrow. So if I don't specify a parent activity, that won't be there at all. The arrow will not be there at all. But if I do specify a parent activity, it'll show that arrow, that left arrow, and it'll take you to 
main activity like I've defined here. It will always take me to main activity. Regardless of how I've gotten to show dinner, it might have taken me five different pages to get there. It will go back to main activity. So that may that may be back a lot further on your back stack than just one step. Again, depending on how you got there. Um, so if you want to learn more about this, um, there's a bunch of links here, Android application to fundamentals. There's a whole article about starting another activity. There's an API guide, there's an API reference. There's more about the intent. There's a whole article about navigation, which this largely covers how the back arrow and the up navigation works, um, and such. Now, one thing I should mention, um, if you read through the documentation on the up navigation, um, this is actually the new way of specifying that. Um, there is an old legacy way of specifying that parent activity. Um, that, if I remember right, got changed around API 60. Um, so you don't need to worry about specifying the meta tag. Um, that's an older version. We don't need that because we're only supporting 21 of these. So if you read through the actual the theory portion of this lesson, it will mention that, um, but it's not something you'll need to use. Yeah. Essen? Okay. Did you edit that header for the If you go back to the emulator? Mm hmm. Yes, you, uh, yes, you can. Um, so let me go to the manifest here. Okay, so under main activity, which is what I'm on, let's say I say Android label I'm going to change that to high. And let's just run the application, run it again. That's it. So if you want to change the, the text that shows up there, you just need to change Android label in the manifest file. Simple as that. Now, I wouldn't want to hard code that like I've just done. I'd want to use a string resource. Um, but that's really all it comes down to is you change the Android label on the, on the activity tag. Other questions? Okay. So, so having finished up the theory here, um, what I want you to do is now start on the labs. Um, so if we go back here, so if you're looking at the code labs, you can either find this on Perusal if you continue with the the um, the uh, if you continue with unit one, um, or you're going to go through here, um, starting at 2.1. Okay, so 2.1 is what we're covering today. Okay, so I want you to go through all of this. When you get towards the end, or if you run into any challenge, any problems, go ahead and call me over. Um, I want you to finish up all of the tasks. So there's four tasks in here. Finish those up, and then do the coding challenge. Um, I want you to submit, I want you to complete that coding challenge, all the tasks by the end of day today, by the end of class. Um, so I'll be ready to, to come by and grade those when you finish up the coding challenge. There's also a homework assignment, which is due by beginning a class tomorrow. So that'll be under this section. Okay. So again, homework is due tomorrow, the coding challenge and the tasks are due today.